every tear will be wiped away. And all pain will be completely removed. Death will be taken out. Death has no more sting. We receive ultimate courage when we place our hope in Him. Tonight, I get the privilege to wrap up our series called The Faith. And so, to start, I want to talk to you about the 2006 Will Ferrell movie called Talladega Nights. And you may or may not be aware, uh, one, don't watch this movie. That is not your homework. The homework is the opposite of that. However, there is a dinner scene in this movie where Will Ferrell begins to pray and he's praying to dear baby Jesus, eight pound, six ounce, uh, cute and cuddly, wrapped up in swaddling. And then this huge argument breaks out about what Jesus is really like or how they like to see their Jesus. Someone pipes in and they're like, I think my Jesus is wearing a tuxedo shirt because I like to party and I think my Jesus likes to party. Someone else is like, I see my Jesus like, and he's got nunchucks. And it just, this crazy scene breaks out because here's a group of people that believe they can customize their God. We live in a day and a culture where people believe exactly the same, that I can customize the temperature in my room by changing the temperature of my aircon. I can customize my shoes. I can customize my phone, my profile, my gender. Therefore, I can customize my God and my faith. And unfortunately, we, li- we live in a day and an age where people uh, do this in reverse. Instead of allowing Scripture to define who God is. We allow our own opinions in our own culture to change our faith. However, Albert Moeller put it this way. Is it our task to force the biblical doctrine of God to enter modern culture? Or is it our task to address modern culture with the biblical doctrine of God? If modern culture or any culture establishes the baseline for the doctrine of God, such a doctrine will clearly bear little resemblance to the God of the Bible. In other words, let's not do it in reverse where we take what we see and we say, oh, God must be like that. No, 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 no. We look at God and allow Him to be who He is, and then we shape our lives to follow suit. And And that's why for this series, we've taken time to look at this ancient statement called the Apostles' Creed, which itself is not found in the Bible, but it's what the early Christians took from the Bible to shape and to clearly articulate the core fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. Because here's what happens. All too often, Christians will go out on emphasis and tangents and they will uh, emphasize just one part of the Christian faith and fall, fall down into what we would call heresy. So we don't want to follow suit. We rather want to be Christians that are well-rounded in our faith. We want to focus on the fundamentals. And so the Apostles' Creed is one of those documents that points out the fundamentals. Check it out on the screen. Thank you, team. It goes like, let's read it out together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Give yourselves a big round of applause. That's so good. And so tonight I get to focus on our final statement, which is, I believe, in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. What an exciting thing to talk about. What an awesome thing to learn about. How cool. Let's check it out. So uh, in 2012, 
I was the children's pastor at Calvary in Townsville, and I was dating a very beautiful girl by the name of Aisha Morris, uh, who was fit as a fiddle, blonde hair and drop dead gorgeous, and I had a V8 car and no longer had a mullet, and so life was going well. Things were good. I had what I thought was one of my dream jobs, dream girl, dream city, dream church. All things were great. (laughs) But in August 2012, uh, we received word that Aisha would need to go in for her second heart surgery. And so we'd been dating for almost two years at this point, And Aisha is a walking miracle. I'm just going to say that from the outset. She uh, had a surgery when she was, a heart surgery when she was four. They came in uh, from her back. And uh, then she was called in when she was 18 years old uh, in 2012 for her second heart surgery. So they needed to pretty much cut down her chest, open her chest, remove her heart from her body and uh, cut the aorta to solve uh, the coarctation in her descending aorta and then put it all back in, put some, some, you know, fake stuff in there and then stitch her back up, wrap it around with wire, allow it to heal back. What? <laughs> That's a lot. Now, here's the, the scary part. She went and chatted and, and met with the surgeon and the surgeon, he said pretty much words of the effect, that he had done 8,000 cardiac surgeries. Now, he's one of the best in Australia. Very few Australian surgeons do this particular uh, surgery. In fact, out of 8,000 of his surgeries, he'd only done 20. Ten of them survived. 50% mortality rate. If she didn't have the surgery... It was high risk of having a heart attack or, you know. So here was a challenge where Aisha was faced and confronted with the truth and the reality of death. Now, I'd love to say as a young man full of faith that I heard this news and I was like, it's okay, babe, we got this, you know, God's good, let's, let's see him do it. I'm going to be honest, it messed me up <laughs> because up until that point, I was invincible. Up until that point, we were invincible. It's like, no, no, we're okay. But, but here's something that it taught me. We are not invincible. You are not invincible. Here's the best news you're going to hear at church tonight. You will die. (laughs) Sorry. The death ratio is one for one. 100% chance. Sorry. (laughs) But you're, you're like, but what about Enoch? You're not that guy. Here's the thing. We are not invincible. And in Australia, with a great healthcare system and with young bodies, we think, no, 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 I'm invincible. I'm younger than that person. I'm more healthy than that person. I eat well. You know, I don't, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. Therefore, I'm going to be fine. Here's what is going to happen. Unfortunately, we will meet our end. We all do. And we must, we must, before we get there, come to an understanding and a true, genuine belief of what do I believe about the afterlife. What do I believe comes next after this life? We need to decide and we need to understand. And I'm so thankful for the Apostles Creed because it says it right there blatantly. As I read out before, we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That's what we believe. And so, if we're going to talk about heaven, we're going to talk about the, the, the new heavens and the new earth and all that awesome stuff. There is a whole lot of scripture that we can look at, but tonight I want to go right to the end of the Bible. And uh, just a quick recommendation, if you're a brand new Christian, don't start with the last book. It's a bit scary. Uh, but rather, maybe once you've understood a bit more about the symbolism and the Christian faith, then we're going to check it out. But this is that triumphant passage that I was mentioning earlier, Revelations chapter 21. Verse 1 to 7. This is John writing. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And as their God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water uh, of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. How cool. I want to ask three questions tonight. One, what is heaven not like? Two, what is heaven like? Three, what the heavens does this change right now? What is heaven not like? I think it's important to clarify because we straight away, I don't know if anybody else saw this Simpsons image. In fact, can we just put it up on the screen? You you know, straight away, we have an image of heaven that it's okay, cool. We get our wings and we're chilling on the clouds like angels. No. Ah, no. (laughs) That's a cartoon. (laughs) But if you look at Scripture, yes, it does show us a whole lot more. But unfortunately, uh, pop culture has warped our understanding of what heaven is really like. We're not going to be ghostly characters without a body that kind of just float around like Casper. No, 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 no. We get heavenly bodies. But guess what? The key thing of the Apostles' Creed is it says the resurrected body. It doesn't say the resuscitated body. So it's not like you and I when we're, you know, in our 80s or whatever time we pass away, you know, and we still, we get up and we go to heaven. We still have that same ailment, that still broken hip, you know. No, no, no. We have a resurrected body. We're also not reincarnated. So it's not like totally different, but rather we get a resurrected, fully fulfilled body. And if you look at Jesus, when Jesus was resurrected, what I love is that Jesus is resurrected. And in those last few days he's on earth, he shows up in a bunch of different places. In fact, one time he walks through a wall. I I just can't wait to get to heaven to just just test that bad boy out. Uh, But also what, what I love is he then, he eats with the disciples. He sits down, he He has a barbecue, he cooks fish with them, eats bread with them and and partakes. For those of us that are thinking, man, heaven's going to be boring because we're just floating around on the clouds for all of eternity. It's one just giant big uh, worship service. And if if we don't keep up, then we just get smacked. No, 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 no. Whoa, just, just change our perspective of what eternity with God is really like because he is the God that created taste buds. Does anybody else here love Italian food? Oh, man. Hey, if you guys haven't been to Kenilworth Donuts, go check it out at Malula Bar. Had four this weekend. I love food. I love food. But guess what? God created food, right? Sometimes we think that, you know, heaven will just be bland and boring. No, 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 no. Imagine unlimited Kenilworth Donuts and zero calories. I'm convinced calories are from the fall of man. Just like mosquitoes and cockroaches. Anyway, what is heaven not like? Heaven's not like the silly cartoon image where we all get wings and we float about. But we need to remember that heaven also, it's not boring. Our God is not boring. There is no single way that heaven could possibly be anything but excellent. Anything but amazing. So let's look at what is heaven like. Now, again, there's so many passages we could look at, but we're going to just go from this one uh, uh, chunk of Scripture and learn just a few things. So what is heaven like? Team will have a list on. 
It's all things made new. It's our true home. It's dwelling with God. And there's no more pain. Now, we could go for ages on this one particular passage on all the great things that that heaven or the new heavens and the new earth will entail. But I want to look at these. Firstly, all things made new. The old earth is gone. The old pain is gone. Think about an old car versus a brand new car. Think about an old body versus a, a strong, fit new body. Think about old, painful wounds. But think about new beginnings. You see, the old is gone and all things are made new. The old has been stained. The old world, unfortunately, is off kilter. Evil exists. Sin exists. Things have gone wrong. And yet Jesus, at the end of time, he makes all things new. He makes the old and replaces it with the new. Our body decays, yet in the new heaven and the new earth, we will have new things, new bodies, new life. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it maps out all the things that happen to the decaying body. It talks about the fact that your eyes are growing dim, your ears are growing deaf, that our hands are growing weak, that our teeth start to fall out, that our desire starts to fade. And those things happen here and now, but they do not happen when all things are made new. But what's more is it is our home. It's our real home. I don't know if you've, you've, so, so in that scripture we read out, behold, it's the dwelling place of God who is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. In other words, this is our ultimate resting place. This is where we belong the most. I don't know if any of you are going home for Christmas, but I remember Aisha and I, uh, uh, I first bringing Aisha to come and see my family. All right. The Peters family is a big one. Uh, there is five siblings. They're all married. Uh, they, they will, and, and they've got kids, and so 11 grandbabies, uh, 11 adults, full house, and here is my brand new fiance, smoking hot, come and meet all my family. <laughs> Sorry, babe. <laughs> and so we rock up. And so the first meal that we have, my family, again, it's a big family, but also like big, you know, we eat big. <laughs> and so anyway, the food is in the middle of the table and it's like dish up. And so I know the drill. I'm like, grab my plate, serve up and chicken, chips, and you know, some of this. And, and Aisha is literally watching this, this horde of vultures just to descend upon the food. And she holds her plate and stares at me and she's like, ah, get me food. And so I grab it and I dish her up. But here's the weird thing about it. My family is crazy. But there's something that when I just chill with them, it just clicks. I'm like, that's why I'm like that. <laughs> oh, that makes so much sense. And when we go home, it's the place that we belong. And yet there's still something missing. To a small extent, every year you, turn, you go home for Christmas, it's just, it's just not quite the same. Yeah, you might be home and it's, it's nice, but we have this internal, intrinsic desire to go to our ultimate home. To be at the very place that is not just our home on earth, but our home that is the ultimate home. C.S. Lewis put it this way. If I find within myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. We have desires that this world cannot satisfy. We have desires that cannot be solved. Maybe it's temporary, but never fully. They can't be solved within this life. John chapter 14, verse 2 to 4, Jesus is <coughs> speaking to the disciples and he's encouraging them. He's about to, can I get some water? He's about to go um, to be crucified. And so he's encouraging them. And this is what he encourages them with. Water. Just kidding. You're too rowdy. <clears throat> John chapter 14. 
In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself where I am, that you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. I want to focus on that. In my father's house, there are many rooms. There is a room for you. The original word was mansions. There are mansions for each of us. There is a space for us that God is so intentional with the afterlife in the preparations for for us coming, that it is our ultimate home. Earth is temporary. You and I were designed for something else. Billy Graham put it this way when he said, my home is heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. You and I, we were designed for something beyond this life. What's more is it's dwelling with God. Heaven, heaven is dwelling with God. It, it means that you and I, we get to be in God's presence. Now, maybe you're, you're new to church, but in the book of Genesis, which is right at the start of the Bible, God creates mankind. He creates a man named Adam. And we find that he, that God and Adam are walking in the garden. They're spending time together. They're speaking. They're communing. They're they're having a relationship. And that's exactly how God designed us to be in God's presence, to be in paradise with him, to have fellowship with him, to have a relationship with him, to dwell in his presence. And if you've uh, had an experience where you've been in the presence of God, maybe you've been in a worship service and you've just felt this overwhelming sense. I was speaking with a new Christian and uh, someone that just joined church recently. And she said to me afterwards, she's like, I literally just cried the whole time. The, The songs were so overwhelming. I'm like, yeah, that's a feeling of the presence of God, that we are just in awe that He is so, so good. Maybe for you, you've opened the Word of God and you've learned something new about Him and the Scripture has jumped out of the page and you've been so overtaken, even emotionally. I'm the kind of person that when that stuff happens, man, I'm a crier. I, I don't care. If I'm in worship and I'm experiencing the presence, yeah, that's fine. There's, there's tears. Let's just lean in to the tears. That's okay. Why? Because I just so love the presence of God. I so love the presence of God. But Here's the thing. In eternity, you and I get to be with Him. We get to be in His presence. There is no place on earth quite like the presence of God. And you and I, in the new heaven and the new earth, we get to experience that. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, In His presence there is fullness of joy. And James 1.17 reminds us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, the heavenly uh, heavenly lights. In other words, God is the giver of all good gifts. He is, and in His presence is all good things. In other words, it is the absence of, of darkness, but the presence of light. It is, it is the absence of everything bad and the presence of everything good. It is the absence of everything evil and the presence of everything holy. That is what it means to be dwelling with God. But here's what I so love. And it reminds us in verse four of this chapter, Revelation 21, verse four. This is, this ought be like highlighted. He will, God will, Wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. One of my favorite definitions of what is heaven, what is the new heavens or the new earth, what is it going to be like? It is the place where all tears are wiped away. It is the place where all mourning is gone. No more trauma, no more anxiety, no more evil, no more abuse, no more violence, no more racism, no more hate, no more death, no more stress. You you, you may have picked up, there was this one little section at the start of the chapter that it says, and I saw the sea was no more. And you're probably like, I love the beach. Why you take Malula Bar? You know, but but what the sea represents throughout 
much of the book of Revelation, particularly in this revelation, uh, particular revelation and, and some of the ones before. In the book of Revelation, the sea actually represents chaos, chaos and evil. Because the, the beasts, the evil beasts come out of the sea. In the book of Isaiah, it also represents a place where, where death dwells. And so here we find that when uh, the author, when John is writing this, he's not saying, no, no, there's no more beachside hangs. And he's not saying that. He's saying the chaos is completely gone. The chaos of your modern day busyness, the chaos of our modern day stress, the chaos that brings on our anxiety and the tension and the chaos of a splitting divorce, of a family being torn apart, the chaos of walking through chronic illness, the chaos of whatever it might be that you and I face in this life, we do not face in the next. The chaos is gone. John MacArthur said, Scripture repeatedly makes clear that heaven is a realm of unsurpassed joy, unfading glory, undiminished bliss, unlimited delights, unending pleasures. Nothing about it can possibly be boring or humdrum. It will be a perfect existence. We will have unbroken fellowship with all of heaven's inhabitants. Life there will be devoid of any sorrows, cares, tear, fears, or pain. That's what heaven is like. So the last question, is what the heavens does that change right now? What does it change in our lives right now? <laughs> the short answer, everything. If I was to give you a short list, hope, courage, compassion, perspective. It brings us hope. It is our ultimate source of hope. Hope can be our driving force in life. But we're not here just kind of sitting, uh, dreaming about escapism. No, 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 that's, that's not what, what this is about. But rather, we are looking forward to our ultimate home, our ultimate hope and our ultimate home. And if our hopes are based on our circumstances working out, if our hopes are based on our status improving, guess what? There reaches a point where it just doesn't keep climbing. There reaches a point where those hopes come up short. Why? Because our ultimate hope needs to be in the hope of Jesus and the eternal life that he came to bring. So another John MacArthur quote for you. We don't seek to escape this life by dreaming of heaven, but we do find we can endure this life because of the certainty of heaven. Heaven is eternal. Earth is temporal. Temporal. Those who fix all their affections on the fleeting things of this world are the real escapists because they are vainly attempting to avoid facing eternity by hiding in fleeting shadows of things that are only transient. So it gives us hope. What's more is it gives us courage. Have you noticed that the disciples, the, the early apostles, these early Christians, how much courage they have? Their boldness. They're just declaring about Jesus, even though they are being thrown into prisons, as Anna mentioned earlier, even though they're being thrown to lions. Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, 11 out of 12 of the disciples were killed, uh, the apostles were killed. And then you find Paul. We're like, yeah, Paul's our hero. Paul died. He had his head cut off. And here's the thing. We look at these guys and we see their courage. How? Because their courage was not based in this life. Their courage was not based in, I just need the Disney fairy tale ending. Their courage was like, no, 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 it's better than Disney fairy tale ending. It's the afterlife where every tear will be wiped away. All pain will be completely removed. Death will be taken out. Death has no more sting. We receive ultimate courage when we place our hope in Him. It's like the ultimate trump card. Aisha and I, we no longer play the game Monopoly Deal. It's a little too competitive in our home. But when we did, there's nothing better than having in your hand a deal breaker, which means you get a full set from the other person, and a just say no, and maybe another deal breaker, just, just for good. As soon as you place down the deal breaker, you have just crushed that person's hope. But if they have a just say no, you can just say no, they just say no. 
Thank you, sucker. I'm going to take that full set and win the game. Has anyone else done this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. All right. You know what I'm saying. Here's the thing. That is the trump card. You and I have the ultimate trump card. That you and I, when we walk into our workplace, what can mere mortals do to this person who has an immortal soul? What can someone do with just their words when their words only last this very moment, but my soul lasts all of eternity? So what do I care more about? Do I care more about over there in all of eternity or do I care about this one moment? And that is what brings us to this rope. Thank you so much, Nora. So right here, I'm going to welcome the worship team up actually. This represents the timeline. You've got all of eternity past, which represents that side of the rope. Then past the orange section, you've got all of eternity future our eternal destination. This right here is human history. So you've got, you know, Genesis, Jesus, God creates the world, and maybe like here we'll put Jesus. Jesus came into the world, you know, been 2,000 years. And then you and I are maybe like here, We're like this tiny little, tiny little moment. And yet there's all of eternity to look forward to. How am I viewing my life? Am I so fixated on what is right here, right now? Or do I have an eternal perspective that says, no, 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 life goes beyond? Am I living now in a way that changes this? Or am I just so fixated on, on this tiny little speck that has so little impact and it's utterly insignificant? Sometimes we need to stop and think about our life 10,000 years from now. Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes we make goals and plans. What's my life going to be like in 10 years? How about 10,000 years? <laughs> Am I living in a way that impacts this? <laughs> Am I living and believing and praying and expressing love and kindness in a way that impacts eternity. And so to wrap us up, I want to ask three questions that we can sit on. We're going to put them on the screen. Firstly, where is my hope? Is my hope in something temporal, temporary, insignificant? Secondly, how am I building towards eternity. Thirdly, what is the heavenly perspective of my situation right now?